Everybody hit continue, all you panelists. Otherwise, I don't know, the recording may not go forward, so. No, I think it will go forward, but I'm just not sure. It, it, you know, it does say it, we're recording. Anyway, we should be good to go, Francis. Okay. Well, hello, friends. Welcome to this 22nd webinar on the secret teachings of all ages by Manley P. Hall. 44 for secret doctrine and 22 for secret teachings. So this webinar series is available on makara.us under the subheadings Mori Federation webinars, then webinar series in progress as shown here. Previous episodes of this and the secret doctrine series are also available on YouTube. Just do a search for Francis Donald secret teachings or secret doctrine. Okay, first of all, a big shout out to Martha Shep for helping me redesign the look and feel of both webinar series. Here are some of the changes. As we move through the material, each paragraph being read will also be highlighted on the left side of the page as it appears in the original edition of The Secret Teachings. Hopefully this will give us a better visual sense of where we are in the text. Improve readability, and it will leave space on the far right for video windows, the chat box, etc. Longer passages of text will now be presented in columns, also make it easier for you cell phone readers, hint, hint, sign up, and all the text will be in a font designed for online reading. So the whole reading experience should be um, quite a bit better now. I've also shifted to a widescreen mode, which hopefully will keep the toolbar from obscuring the bottom of the page. We've had that uh, issue with a couple of you all, and um, hopefully that will disappear now. Anyway, let me know how this all works out for you, if there's any other issues that come up. Okay, as we move into our study of Atlantis, for the first time in our survey of secret teachings, we move from the verifiable history with its period documents, ruins, and artifacts into an area that requires of us a certain rigor in our choice of source material. Since Plato's time, there have been hundreds of books written on Atlantis. Some of these are quite good. Others, not so much. Pure fancy. For this reason, we'll confine ourselves to a few, a short list of well-known sources, which include interpretations of Plato's accounts of Atlantis from his Timaeus and Critias, as well as the writings of HPV, DK, MPH, Ignatius Donnelly, John Mitchell, Edgar Cayce, and brief quotes from a few others. The historical period of the eight mystery schools we've covered so far spanned approximately 2,000 years, and thus represents an important but relatively brief chapter in the development of the fifth root race. On the other hand, Atlantis, we're told, existed for millions of years and was home to all the subraces of the fourth root race. In spite of this vast influence and a marked contrast to the eight European mystery schools that we've studied, we have no physical evidence from Atlantean times, no ruins, artifacts, or documents. What we do have are accounts from Plato's Timaeus and Critias, which reflect statements made by the 7th century BC Greek statesman Solon, who heard about Atlantis from Egyptian priest in Sais, Egypt. And importantly, we have the keen intuition of MPH, the words of those masters that worked through HPB, and we have DK, who for his students, is all we need in the way of verification of Atlantis's existence. In addition, we have convincing arguments of um, Ignatius Donnelly's Atlantis, the antediluvian world. 
Donnelly, often quoted by both MPH and HPB, describes over 600 similarities between cultures separated by the Atlantic, his premise being that Atlantis was the common source of names, gods, architectural elements, and mythologies for all the nations that bordered the lost continent. Could we get a, a reader to start us off for this HPB quote about Donnelly's book? Uh, yes, Greg, can you start us off, please? Sure. In that wonderful volume of Donnelly's Atlantis, the Antediluvian World, the author speaking of the Aryan colonies from Atlantis and of the arts and sciences, the legacy of our fourth race bravely announces that the roots of the institutions of today reach back to the Miocene age. This is an enormous allowance for a modern scholar to make, but civilization dates still further back than the Miocene Atlanteans. Secondary period man will be discovered and with him his long forgotten civilization. Thank you, Greg. So we're talking about Lemuria and the civilizations uh, that uh, came before Atlantis. We also have John Mitchell's geometrical analysis of the measurements given by Plato's fascinating stuff. And finally, Edgar Cayce, who discovered during his trance readings that over half of his clients had had an incarnation in Atlantis, especially, interestingly, North American clients. Mm -hmm. yeah. So with no further ado, let's take a look at the first paragraph of Atlantis and the Gods of Antiquity. Can we get a reader, please? Lynn, can you read that for us, please? Atlantis is the subject of a short but important article appearing in the annual report of the Board of Regents of the Smithsonian Institution for the year ending June 30th, 1915. The author, M. Pierre Termier, a member of the Academy of Sciences and Director of Service at the, of the Geologic Chart of France, in 1912 delivered a lecture on the Atlantean hypothesis before the Institut Oceanographique. It is the translated notes of this remarkable lecture that are published in the Smithsonian Report. Okay, let's continue. New reader, please. I'll read it. After a long period of disdainful indifference, writes M. Termeri A., however, observe how in the last few years, science is returning to the study of Atlantis. How many naturalists, geologists, zoologists, or botanists are asking one another today whether Plato has not transmitted to us with slight amplif amplification a page from the actual history of mankind. No affirmation is yet permissible, but it seems more and more evident that a vast region, continental or made up of great islands has collapsed west of the pillars of Hercules, otherwise called the Strait of Gibraltar, and that its collapse occurred in the not far distant past. In any event, the question of Atlantis is placed anew before men of science. And since I do not believe that it can ever be solved without the aid of oceanography, I have thought it natural to discuss it here in this temple of maritime science and to call such a problem long scorned, but now being revived, the attention of oceanographers as well as the attention of those who, though immersed in the tumult. tumult of cities, lend an ear to the distant murmur of the sea. And one more time. Can we get a reader? Oops, yes. Martha G., um, let me find you so I can unmute you. Um, did somebody unmute you, Martha? There you go. Thank you. In this lecture, and, Monsieur? 
Tremier presents geologic, geographic, and zoologic data in substantiation of the Atlantic, Atlantis theory, figuratively draining the entire bed of the Atlantic Ocean. He considers the inequalities of its basin and cities and sites locations on a line from the Azores to Iceland, where dredging has brought lava to the surface from a depth of 3,000 meters. The volcanic nature of the islands now existing in the Atlantic Ocean corroborates Plato's statement that the Atlantean continent was destroyed by volcanic cataclysms. Jared Termier also advances the conclusions of a young French zoologist, Monsieur Louis Germain, who admitted the existence of an Atlantic continent connected with the Iberian Peninsula and with Mauritania and prolonged toward the south so as to include some regions of desert climate. Sir Termier concludes his lecture with a graphic picture of the engulfment of that continent. Okay, thanks, Martha. Any thoughts or questions about these first three paragraphs? Here's the title page of the 700-page Smithsonian Annual Report, as well as the first page of the article by Termier. This is very serious, well-regarded scientific annual report. After commenting on Plato's Timaeus and Critias, Termier describes the composition and varying elevations of the seabed of the Atlantic Ocean in some detail. It's very scientific. And through this info, formulates possible locations for the lost continent. However, since plate tectonics were unknown in Termier's time, actually they were just put forth in 1912 when this paper came out, he was unable to satisfactorily determine the means by which large land masses might rise and fall. Nonetheless, he forwards a convincing geologic model, finishing with these words. I'll also give you a sense of the report itself. Could we get a, a um, reader, please? I'm sure. Uh, Andrea, can you read that for us, please? Yes, but I'm not. Ah, there it is. Yeah, you're good. We can hear you. It. Summing up, there are strong reasons for believing in the Atlantic prolongation of the tertiary folds, those of the Atlas Mountains toward the Canaries, those of the Alps toward the southern islands of the Azores, but nothing yet permits of either extending very far or limiting very narrowly. Hold on, hold on. We're losing you. And there's, yeah, no, I'm sorry. The sediments in Epic, that is, were terminated in, got, got me? No. Uh, we're, terminated in Europe. You're okay. breaking up quite a bit. I, yeah. It's, I a, it's a peculiar kind of a long. It, it may be where I am, where I am. So I'm sorry. Maybe I shouldn't read them today. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. We'll get, we'll get Thank another you. reader. Thank you. Joe, can you read that uh, page for us, please? Sure. Summing up, there are strong reasons for believing in the Atlantic pro prolongation of the tertiary folds, those of the Atlas Mountains toward the Canaries, those of the Alps toward the southern islands of the Azores, but nothing yet permits of either extending very far or limiting very narrowly this prolongation. The sediments of Santa Maria prove only this, that at the Miocene epoch, that is when the great Alpine movements were terminated in Europe, a Mediterranean shore extended not far from this region of the Azores, the shore of a continent or of a large island. Another shore of the same Miocene sea passed near the Canaries. Such are the data, are the data of geology. The extreme mobility of the Atlantic region, especially in conjunction with the Mediterranean depression and the great volcanic zone, 3000 kilometers or 1875 miles broad, which extend from north to south. That's probably the, right, <laughs> sorry. In the Eastern half of the present ocean, the certainty of the occurrence of immense depressions when islands and even continents have disappeared, 
the certainty that some of these depressions date as from yesterday are of quaternary age and that consequently they might have been seen by man. The certainty that some of them had been sudden or at least very rapid. See how much there is to encourage those who still hold out for Plato's narrative. Geologically speaking, the Platonian history of Atlantis is highly probable. Okay, and this is from that report that I showed earlier. Thank you, Joe. Uh, so there's been dozens of recent location theories for Atlantis, indicated here by the yellow circles, including a large underwater plateau off the coast of northern Spain, the Canary and Azores Islands, the Irish Sea, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All these locations are far smaller than the Asia-sized landmass described by Timaeus and by HPB. The difficulty encountered when considering Atlantis's most traditionally placed location, the Atlantic Ocean, is that there is no geological model uh, in current science that provides a convincing explanation of how an Asia-sized landmass could have sunk to the level of the present-day Atlantic seafloor. Though Ignatius Donnelly points out that only a small warping of the Earth's crust, one eight thousandth of a percent, would be necessary to raise and sink whole continents, and that there is evidence of such warping from the past. So any questions at this point, we're going to be uh, setting aside this um, totally scientific approach. Uh, so any questions about this or comments um, uh, about this aspect or this approach to the Atlantis, lost Atlantis continent? Yes, that got lots of hands up. Let's okay. start with Scott and then uh, Greg, OK? Um, Go ahead, Scott. Um, I noticed you didn't have a, a, red, a, a yellow dot in the Mediterranean because that's a pretty hot. Um, well, there's one, there's one here sort of in the northern Mediterranean in this area. Well, but, yeah, but, but they haven't. They like to think that uh, uh, Santorini. Uh, right. That one of the sources, that's a, a hot one. Yeah, I'd be down here, right? Down there. Yeah, right about there. Yeah. That's all. Anyway, yes. Yeah. Uh, so, are you saying? I'm not sure your point here. All, all I'm pointing out is that that's when I I, I come across fairly often. Huh? I see. Where is going yeah, to? Yeah. Yada yada. Yeah, and it's you know it's really missing the point. You oh, know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know. Uh, it's sort of ignoring the fact that this was, you know, uh, an, a landmass equal to Asia, you know, not equal to a Greek island. So, yes, indeed. Uh, yeah, Greg. Uh, if you look at the, um, if you go back to the page you were just on, if you look in this area of the, um, in the middle of the Atlantic, there is a gap. Uh, between uh, the the north the eastern coastline of the United States, and then you also got um, that's a pretty huge gap. Um, in terms of Plato time, I'm not sure Plato really had a good sense of of space in any case, because um, they were just beginning to understand distances then. But for him, for him to see something like that. Of course, he would probably um, blow it out of proportion just because yeah. we have that but, limitation. But he wasn't the one that blew it out of proportion. It was all those that came after him. All he said is that it's the land that exists beyond this strait where my arrow is here, mm -hmm. uh, which is called the Pillars of Hercules. You know, it's where the two continents come together, right? And he just called it the sea beyond. So. Clearly, Atlantis, according to both HPB and um, uh, Plato, existed in this area, as shown in this map, which is a little hard to read. Um, you know, it's 
because the idea here is that the continents have shifted so dramatically since then. And we know this, you know, uh, uh, from other evidence that there's been, you know, huge geological shifts, you know, the Gaia, the Gaia or Gaia idea of, you know, one continent then breaking into several. But yeah, thanks for your point, uh, Greg. Anything else? Oh, yeah. The other thing is the dots where, um, where, I mean, the dots off of the coast of Africa, off the, in the, around the Azores, and of course in Central America, they, I think the further research, they've found very similarities to animals, uh, animal right. history that seems very impossible yeah. at such distances. Exactly. But also Asia is way, way bigger. I, I mean, I, calling it an Asia-sized continent is just the only thing I was pointing out. It may be, it would probably fit almost touching both the coasts. That's right. It, yeah, and then it would be yeah. considered, sort I wouldn't like call it a, Asian, but yeah. This area where I'm, I'm inscribing, you know, would be more likely. And, you know, this is, this is Ignatius Donnelly's primary premise, since let's bring his book back up here. Um, it's his fundamental premise is this idea that um, there's too many uh, geologic, zoologic, um, and cultural uh, similarities. Um, when, I meant, when I said geologic, I meant actually archaeologic, uh, like pyramids, etc. That, you know, for it to be coincidence or just, you know, through commerce or whatever, and that there had to be some common source for all of this, uh, these influences, but so, yeah, thanks. Um, okay. And we have multiple hands still up. Good. Um, let's go with Lynn first and then Lisa and then Trudy. Okay. So Lynn, you're up. So Francis, you mentioned shifts and I, I was getting a ping on the theory of polar shifts. Right was put forward by Charles Holland or something like that. And how that could absolutely be um, catastrophic enough that a whole continent could be submerged and other lands be brought up from the ocean. Yeah, the, other sure is that, so. yeah. the other ping is looking at the point where um, in South Africa, uh, South America, sorry, um, Peru and the um, Machu Picchu Right. And the whole culture throughout both Central America and South America being very definitely infused with, um, obviously, the, the Atlantean names and, and the rest yeah. of it. Right, right. Yeah, and this is a good example of how uh, the derivation of Atlantis being uh, at this at this golden circle where my arrow is, which is, you know, the Machu Picchu region, doesn't have anything to do with continents going up or down. That has to do with the a culture that has been uh, that existed there uh, in um, you know uh, historic times. So it's unlike some of these other points, you know, especially the Irish Sea and Azores and uh, the Canary Islands. You know, where they are actually suggesting that there may have been a greater landmass. This is a purely cu cultural, uh, because this is way up high in the mountains, right? So, um, yeah, thank you, Lynn. Okay, before I go to um, Lisa and Trudy, I want to read what Ann Veronica has typed in. She says, the story was told to him, and I believe she means Plato, by the Egyptians. And um, they started by telling him that his nation doesn't remember all of this because of the catastrophe that happened in the area of Greece. Yeah, that's you bring up a whole interesting chapter. It was actually Solon, the statement, the statesman, um, seventh century BC Greece statesman, Athenian statesman, uh, who went to Egypt and um, to Sais, which is a an area where there were was a very strong temple, and uh, heard it from the priests. 
of Saïs. And like you said, like you said, mentioned, uh, Veronica, they made fun of the Greeks saying they were like children because of their short memory, historically speaking, right? Uh, that, you know, for Greeks, a thousand years takes them all the way back into prehistory. And the Egyptians had this continuous awareness all the way back into Atlantean times. So, yeah, thanks for that. Anyone else? Oh, yeah. Still have two hands up. Okay, I'm Lisa, good. go ahead, please. Okay. Um, I was really going to say exactly what um, Lynn and Gregory said about um, the landmass, the central landmass being in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean yeah. um, and the yellow um, dotted areas kind of being culturally represented of the main Atlantis yeah um, exactly and again with pole shifts and the uh, rising and falling of land masses um which would be expected after every root race and before the emergence of a new one um that's what i have learned in my uh, normal studies <laughs> uh, that that's really what i wanted to yeah comment. thank you yeah um yeah you have to remember most of these yellow dots in fact i think all of these uh, yellow dots are um, working in a in a much more collapsed time frame than you know the, the millions of years uh, ago that Atlantis is. Uh, it's told by theosophical sources that Atlantis thrived, right? Um, that they're looking for much more recent instances of civilization. So you know they're looking for like off of Spain here, there's a, it's not indicated here, but there's a, a, a beach or a coastal region that's submerged that extends out to sea quite a bit. Uh, but you know, it's still, it's nothing like um, uh, the size necessary in order to have, have been a continent like Atlantis. So, okay, anyone else? Um, yes, uh, Trudy's had her hand up for a while. Go ahead, Trudy, and then we've got a couple of um comments yeah um i have read that um the west side of the british isles is also connected to uh, remnants of atlantis mm, yeah i don't doubt it i don't know yeah. i imagine that the island was you know um well one observer i can't remember this source um i guess it had to be uh, described by Plato, but I can't remember. But anyway, he said that you could go in a in a normal sized boat, which you know would have been a, a a Greek trium or you know a normal boat, not an ocean craft at all. You could go from island to island and and connect all the way across. So that suggests a uh, you know there's also as as we'll learn in the webinar there were three very large islands and seven smaller islands. So it was very much a maritime kind of a um, continent, right? Yeah. And I have no doubt that, that it influenced the Druidic um, uh, culture and, yeah. uh, and therefore there were remnants up here. Mm. It wasn't uh, Bermuda also was connected to Atlantis. Yeah, you know, on the other side, the you know, the west coast of Atlantis would be then connected over here. Yeah. And all these, you know, cultural um, similarities um, across the ocean, you know, are, are one of the main reasons, one of two reasons, basically, that these um, uh, ideas of where Atlantis was come forth, you know, either culturally or geographically are the two basic theories, you know. Yeah, thank you. Uh, anyone else? Oh, yes, we have a bunch of comments. Okay, Anne Veronica says, um, no, it was not said in fun about the Greeks. It says, actually, they implied that the people living in the area are very old in origin, but they do not remember it. Oh, uh -huh. okay. Thank you for that correction. And then um, Vivian says, 
looking at this map, one can imagine that Africa and the Americas were joined. Yeah. I wonder if Atlantis was that continent before they drifted apart. Quite probable. Yeah, it's it's described as being its own continent, not Africa or South America, right? Um, so I would say it's after that. See, when when South America and Africa were joined, you had this Gaia um, singular monocontinent. And I think that goes back even earlier. Um, I think this was a separate continent. It's, it's always described that way from the rather than these two joined together. Um, so, OK, anyone else? Uh, yep, lots. OK, Gregory says, I think Irish myth and Gaelic mythology, if really explored, could prove the existence of Atlantis. But I'm not sure they carried a written narrative for that long of history, except when you explored the ruins. Yeah, see, the problem with Atlantis is there's nothing uh, at all. Nothing survives. Only what was communicated in basically two sources, you know, um, through these Saidic Saiz priests to Solon, that's you know that's the hard line source, and then we have uh, in those who have intuited information like um, HPB. Now I think it goes far beyond um, you know uh, getting a vague sense, but this is definite teaching from the masters that work through. You know, DK himself being a master and telling us in no uncertain terms. So that's, you know, as far as I'm concerned, that's it. There was an Atlantis. But, you know, he doesn't tell us much about its physical aspects at all. It's mostly about its fourth root race qualities. HPB, on the other hand, does tell us more about that. And, um, and she describes, you know, using Donnelly quite a bit, which is one of the reasons I made him a primary source is because she felt that he was uh, an important um, and verifiable source. So, And that's the only thing we have. We don't have any, any way of drawing, you know, um, links culturally back, except for to compare that which came culturally from a presumed Atlantis. There's some noise here. Could you find the source of that and hit the mute on it? There, thanks. Um, yeah, next. Oh, this is the last one. Lisa says, I did hear that the Bermuda Triangle strangeness may have been due to negative energies of the main island of Atlantis. And in parentheses, she says black magic. Uh, you know, I don't doubt it at all because it, it, I've read about that Bermuda Triangle. It's it's some spooky stuff that's gone on in there. And, um, you know, I and there's other indications that the Atlantean influence uh, was very strong in that area, even up to and including the southern United States. So, yeah, I would agree with you on that. Is that it? Did you say? Yes, that was the last one for now. This is okay. quite a quite an interesting topic you've got going here, Francis. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Thanks to MPH, right? Who's uh, chosen to include it right at this point. Um, Okay, so um, at this point, uh, MPH moves uh, from, you know, this idea of the geologic possibilities uh, into Atlantis's history and mythology. So he, he turns an abrupt corner here. So could we get a reader for this paragraph, please? Uh, yes. Uh Scott, can you read that for us, please? Let me get down here to, oh, did he go away? I'm here. Oh, good. And you're unmuted, too. Thanks. How about that? Yeah. The description of the Atlantean civilization given by Plato and the Curtius may be summarized as follows. In the first ages, the gods divided the earth among themselves, apportioning it according to their respective dignities. Each became the peculiar deity of his own allotment and established therein temples to himself, ordained a priestcraft, and instituted a system of sacrifice. 
Poseidon was given the sea in the island continent of Atlantis. In the midst of the island was a mountain, which was the dwelling place of three earthborn primitive human beings, Evanor, his wife, Lucipi, and their only daughter, uh, Cleto. The maiden was very beautiful, and after the sudden death of her parents, she was wooed by Poseidon, who begat by her five pairs of male children. Poseidon apportioned his continent among these 10, and Atlas, the eldest, he made overlord of the other nine. Poseidon further called the country Atlantis and the surrounding sea, the Atlantic, in honor of Atlas. For the birth of his 10 sons, Poseidon divided the continent and the coastwise sea into concentric zones of land and water, which were as perfect as though turned upon a lathe. Two zones of land and three of water surrounded the central island, which Poseidon caused to be irrigated with two springs of water, one warm and the other cold. Thank you, Scott. Any thoughts or questions about this paragraph? We're going to be really drilling down because there's a lot of stuff here. Yes. First up. You have a hand up. Okay, let's see. Go ahead. Go ahead, Brian. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, it was kind of interesting. I had this uh, kind of a crazy thought based on a, a vision that I had. I'm not sure if it really applies here or not. But <clears throat> long time ago, I actually saw the Sphinx, uh, living, breathing angel. But the face on it was slightly different than the real Sphinx. But, but the point is, in esoteric astrology, there's actually three charts. There's the chart of the world. There's the chart of the esoteric chart and the hierarchical charts. And they can all be positioned, theoretically, around the head of the Sphinx. And if each of the gods claimed a portion of the earth, uh, is it possible that the uh, exoteric wheel, uh, esoteric astrology, that they could be proportioned around the Sphinx in that manner across the earth? Um, I don't yeah. really know. It's just an idea. Well, it, no, no, no. I can uh, address that. Uh, you know, the pyramid is... The, the chosen side of the pyramid was very specific. I can't remember offhand the, uh, the longitude and latitude, but it was, um, the, it was chosen as a kind of center of the world kind of place for that time. The Sphinx, of course, is right there. You know? And the idea is that these 12 gods um, up here, the first ages, there were actually 12 gods that divided the earth among themselves and that they are directly connected to the constellations, uh, the astrological constellations, right? With yeah. Neptune slash Poseidon being, of course, connected with Pisces, right? right. So right. you would have then a further connection to the ages of these um, um, constellations, Right. right. Um, uh, as well as to their various symbols, you know, like you have a, 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 a Leo Virgo symbol in the in the Sphinx. And so the the God who is relevant to that symbol would be gaining up a some one twelfth of the earth at this time. Of course, this is all symbolic. But uh, yeah, so. Thanks. That's an interesting observation. Anyone else? Um, Lynn says Orion's belt. Uh, I think she's referring to the uh, pyramids and their configuration as Orion's belt. Right, Lynn? Yes. Okay. There are there are certain. Uh, <laughs> They're called airways, but they're they're they were siding channels that pointed to different stars, and uh, at different times uh, as the um, as the equinox uh, 
is in a constant state of rotation. And so in that precession of the equinoxes, you have this, these uh, siding channels uh, that are focused on different stars. And, you know, my theory is that that brings in uh, different energies uh, relevant to the age of the times. So thank you, Lynn. And anyone else? No, that's all okay. we've got right now. So first up, in the first ages, the gods divided the earth among themselves, proportioning it according to their respective dignities. Each became the peculiar deity of his own allotment. To Poseidon was given the sea and the island continent of Atlantis. The earth was divided between 12 gods, which are described beneath the illustration in the middle of page 33, where this chapter starts. And so can we get a reader for this? Yes, Terry, can you read that for us, please? Yes. The scheme of the universe according to the Greeks and Romans. By ascending successively through the fiery sphere of Hades, the spheres of water, earth, and air, and the heavens of the moon, the plane of Mercury is reached. Above Mercury are the planes of Venus, the Sun, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, the latter containing the symbols of the zodiacal, zodiacal constellations. Above the arch of the heavens, Saturn, is the dwelling place of the different powers controlling the universe. The supreme council of the gods is composed of 12 deities, six male and six female, which correspond to the positive and negative signs of the zodiac. The six gods are Jupiter, Vulcan, Apollo, Mars, Neptune, and Mercury. The six goddesses are Juno, Ceres, Vesta, Minerva, Venus, and Diana. Jupiter rides his eagle as the symbol of his sovereignty over the world, and Juno is seated upon a peacock, the proper symbol of her haughtiness and glory. Well, thank you, Carrie. And so we can see the 12 gods and goddesses arrayed at the top of the illustration there on the right, um, upper right. Any thoughts about which, um, well, wait, first of all, in order to gain a, a truer understanding of these opening lines, uh, we first have to determine what level of consciousness and scope of influence these quote unquote gods represent. In uh, the second volume of A Secret Doctrine, HPB lists seven possible levels that the term gods might relate to. Can we get a reader for this? Uh, yes. Uh, Katerina has her hand up. So um, why don't you ask your question and then if you can read that for us afterwards, please. Can you unmute yourself? There's a little icon with a microphone with a slash through it. Just click on it uh, on your toolbar and you should be. Well, I asked her to unmute it. I, she should, whoops, she went away. Unmute, okay. I there you are. Sorry. No, that's Brian. No, we're, we're looking for who? Uh, Katerina. Okay. Well, she had, she had her hand up and she no longer has her hand up and, um, okay. It, let's get another reader. Um, let's see, Trudy, can you read that for us, please? Let me ask you to unmute. I can't. First. Right. There you go. There you go. First of the noumena of the intelligent powers of nature. Second the cosmic forces, third, the celestial bodies, fourth, the gods of Diane Shoans, five, the psychic and spiritual powers, six, of divine kings on earth, 
or the incarnations of the gods, and sevens of terrestrial heroes or men. The knowledge how to discern among these seven forms, the one that is meant belonged belonged uh, at all times to the initiates whose earliest predecessors pre predecessors 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 had uh, created this symbolical and allegorical system sacred doctrine too yeah thank you um okay so it's an interesting division in and of itself um any thoughts about which of these seven forms of divinity might be most relevant for the gods who, quote, divide the earth among themselves? Well, while everybody's thinking about that, right. and Veronica says one wonders where the seventh god and goddess are. I'm not sure what she means by that. Um, okay, uh, MPH, you know, as you know, that's Manley P. Hall. Um, in his essay, Atlantis and Interpretation, gives us a clue. Could we get a reader for this? Okay. And, and this we is have... a clue. Okay, I'm let sorry. me just finish my sentence. This is a clue about at which of these seven levels our god um, Poseidon is uh, relates to, you know, in terms of his uh, overseeing of, of the continent of Atlantis. Now, go ahead. Okay, um, we have a couple of hands up and I think Brian's um, mic is open. So, uh, Brian, can you read that for us, please? And then uh, ask your question. Yeah, we, we're hearing a lot of background noise. Thank is that you. coming from is that coming from me yeah it is um, oh you're good now you're good now just you know okay uh, right. don't you drum on your microphone okay uh i'm trying on these new headphones i'm not even sure where the microphone is located i might need to okay. move things around but it says okay. it should be it says it should be remembered that the universe was not yet visible as a corporal body rather the germs of the universe have been immersed in the seminal fluids of space the principle of body building of form, of forming and reproducing was being developed within the spiritual nature of the world. Poseidon, the personification of humidity and moisture, was the peculiar guardian and god of this project. Thank you. So Poseidon is a personification of humidity and moisture from which the world of form was to be fashioned is definitely a noumenal being a causal force of nature right you have to constantly be trans uh what trans um <laughs> what's the word i want uh, transliteration just, just translating these uh forces upward because in the myth of course they're they're described as personages of uh, you know who who are active as though they were walking around influencing other people, right? And so you constantly have to uh, uh, shift your understanding uh, onto causal levels. So in the next paragraph of his essay, MPH addresses this force of nature in terms of its influence on the earth. Could we get a reader for this, please? Okay, well, um, Brian actually had his hand up to ask a question and someone else does too. Go ahead. So uh, Brian, right. did you have a question? Yeah. <clears throat> um, um, the gentleman asked a question earlier, um, but he kind of skipped over it quickly, and I, I didn't remember what his question was. It was something, could we answer it? And then he said, well, everybody's thinking about that. We'll do this. Oh, that's all right. We, we don't need to pick up every stitch along the way. Oh, okay. 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 So uh, could we get a reader, please? Okay. Um, Oops, wait a minute. Oh, 
Um, I was going to ask Samuel because he's got his hand up, but he's using an older version of uh, Zoom, and so it won't allow me to let him talk. Um, Samuel, is that right? Uh, Samuel, uh, if, if you can hear me, I assume you can. What you can do is, is quit the session and download the new version. It will take literally a minute and then it will reinstall itself and then you can uh, come back in and it will engage your new version of Zoom. All that will take about two minutes and then you will be able to speak. If you don't want to do that, you can just hang out and do it later. But you, you, and this goes for everybody. You want to always stay with the latest version of Zoom because they change all the time their accessibility based on version. So, you know, and here's a good example. So anyway, go ahead. He did. Okay. So he did that. All right. So we still have a couple of more questions, but I'll go ahead and read this. Um, the super mundane gods acting through Zeus distributed space to the 12 zodiacal orders of gods. To the last of these, Poseidon, lord of the constellation of the fishes, was assigned the empire of the watery element. It was here that he was to establish his kingdom and rule over it. It should not be interpreted that Poseidon merely received the watery parts of the planet Earth. At the time the gods distributed the universe, there was no Earth and no sea as we know them. The sea over which Poseidon was given rulership was the humidity of space within which the form of the world were to be built. In the allegory, the universal place of generation is set forth in terms of the form of the solar system with its planets or of the earth with its zones. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, quite a shift in understanding, isn't it? Um, any, any thoughts or questions about this? Yeah, we've got a couple of hands, but we've also had a couple of comments for a little bit. Um, and Veronica wants to know, on what plane is this? Yeah. Um, I would say it's on the cosmic etheric, uh, uh, physical etheric planes, because it is um, involutionally um, creative in the sense that these are this is the uh, realms wherein the form aspect will be determined. Like the, you know, for instance, for the fourth root race, the Manu of that root race would have had a, a lot to do with this, right? In, um, in the cho in the choosing of this particular um, Diani Chohan that is being called Poseidon, right, uh, which was to oversee this entire root race. Uh, or at least, you know, that's what we're led to believe here. Uh, and would it, he, he would have worked hand in hand with the uh, Manu of the fourth root race, right? And they, uh, I don't remember if the Manus change with each root race, but they're the, the fastest changings of those highest. Uh, uh, so, yes, I, my understanding is it would, um, of course, all of this originally comes you know, on a solar level on the on the uh, cosmic mental plane. But remember, we are talking about a, a, a period in Earth's evolution. So I think for that reason, we're definitely within the solar system and uh, and therefore in the cosmic physical. That's as I see it now, specifically more than that. Um, I think you're looking at at a transfer through each subplane, right? And what MPH is emphatically trying to to uh, describe to us here is these numinal uh, subplanes of the higher etheric, what you'd call the cosmic etheric. You know, now whether it's the monadic or the atmic, I would say it comes down through all those. Now that's not speaking with absolute authority, but that's that's my take on it. 
Okay, we have a number of hands, but I want to read um, what Ephrosini says. She says, I remind you that Poseidon had claimed the city of Athens and had um, lost from the goddess Athena, the goddess of wisdom. Athens is the city that fights against Atlantis. Yeah. Poseidon is the god of water of the astral world. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But see, there's many levels of Poseidon-ness, right? Ultimately, it was the transition uh, from the fourth root race to the fifth. It was represented by the war between Atlantis and Greece. Right. And the defeat, of course, of the fourth root race, that was the the transition necessary. And then, you know, again, the myth tells us that in a day, um, the last vestige of Atlantis sunk beneath the waters. But, you know, we also have the Earth created in seven days. So you have to take that, you know, as a cycle of time. Right. Um, though that it is emphatically stated that in a day, you know, it was these warriors were literally submerged. Uh, let's see. I think I kind of answered that. Okay. Um, Greg, you got your hand up. You want to go first? Uh, yeah. Um, it's really interesting that MPH would choose the element of water in, in that way. But when you think of uh, in the early um, uh, material out of the treatise on cosmic fire, that the origins of, of our solar system and, and our existence is dependent upon the relationship of fire at the very core spark of fire. But then we also have to recognize that um, fire manifests in a million different it manifests in all seven planes in the in the extent that at the core level of the mineral kingdom is is solid water but water itself is of fire you have to think of it in terms and it's humid so that means that there's some kind of heat but it's just in terms of the chemistry and the alchemical teachings yeah um water is just another phase of fire from the from the level of the very core base of the mineral kingdom all the way up to the uh, cosmic ethereal is that water they're just different forms of water and we we call them water air right fire i mean we call them water air gas yeah and yeah. it just goes on and on but that's that's all i wanted to say that you have to think in terms of from the from the picture that the element water is is not contains the life force within it as a spark in a different in a different density or form. Yeah, some good points there. Um, here's one simple way to think of it. Um, in if, at its most elemental phase, you have fire and you have water. Of course, water isn't literal water. It's the fecundating agent. It's the divine mother. It's mula prakriti. It's the substantive realm. And fohat is the agency by which fire is sent forth to impress consciousness on this form aspect. And then you have these myriad levels of effect that come down through, you know, they're called the seven brothers Fohat and Fohat is fire. It's the electricity, right? And so on each level, and you could look at this either cosmically or systemically that on the cosmic physical plane, each subplane has its Fohatic quote unquote brother, which means a type of electrical phenomena that is, um, effective with that level of substantive reality, right? So in, in a myriad of different ways, fire and water interrelate through Fohat, okay? So Poseidon represents that watery aspect, which is also inherently involutional, right? If you have noumenal water, you're talking about an involutional process. 
Um, and we will be getting into this in detail. So I don't want to spend too much more time on it now, but uh, we'll be talking about just how the myth and the um, descent of this uh, of this concept of the watery element um, correlate. All right. Okay. Uh, can we get a reader for this? Or okay, we don't? I, I already read that one and we still have two. Okay. Hands. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Brian, go ahead. Brian. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Hello? Okay. Yeah, I wanted to point out um, that I thought that it was interesting because um, the different gods being mentioned, it also sounded to me like it was almost affirming that, like, on a hierarchical level, that maybe the sun or the god that rules Pisces. Uh, was the uh, was <clears throat> Pisces was affiliated with the intelligent substance that you know created the universe, and I thought that it was interesting because different people are talking about air and fire and water, but if you notice the fact that uh, Pisces, the god of the waters, and Neptune is also associated with planetary rulers, Pluto, which is associated with fire, and Jupiter with air, and Neptune with water, they're all actually rulers of Pisces. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. And you will and see. Not and not only that, but sometimes I feel like in the mythological and where the mythological meets with the ancient Egyptian religion is that, whoops, um, is that the, it could have been that maybe, you know, um, the Nept uh, Poseidon, could have been possibly conjunct Pluto, Jupiter, and Neptune in Pisces, and maybe even potentially conjunct the Earth and Leo in the center of the wheel. But the wheel they're talking about could potentially be a whole wheel of Atlantis, could potentially also be an esoteric wheel that's more on the astral plane as well. Cosmic astral. You know? Yeah, cosmic yeah, astral. Cosmic astral. Yeah. Cosmic astral, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's possible because there's cycles beyond, you know, the uh, procession of the equinoxes uh, and, you know, that take us through the 12 signs as we know them. Um, certainly, you know, when you're talking about a, a root race that lasts millions of years, you're going to have every imaginable astrological influence occur during that time, you know, uh, from the... Right you know, from the simpler perspective, but the, this belongs to an unseen cycle. Uh, and, it, you know, I'd be interested if any astronomers have uh, have looked into this, you know, are there, you know, four million long, year long cycles that would account or align with these root races? You know, if anybody's done any um, uh, research into that, you know, speak up. Um, thank you, Brian. Okay, uh, Carrie, you wanna, you got your hand up, you wanna. Yeah, um, we never see uh, Neptune or Poseidon without the trident. Right. Now, um, it's it would appear to me that, uh, well, there's two things about it. It appears to be a rod of initiation. Yeah. And also because of the three prongs, um, it suggests that he is doing the whole initiation by himself. There, there are three parts. There are normally three people involved in the uh, three forces involved in the initiation. It appears that he can do the whole job by himself. I wonder what you think about that. <laughs> that's interesting. I, I don't think that's the meaning of the threefold nature um, of it, that he can do it without the... Um, um, with the help of um, sponsors. Um, but, you know, it's just an opinion. I think it has to do with the with the air, water, and earth plane, which is the also the realm of the third principle, which is very much connected to, you know, the very fact of the ruler of water suggests the substantive realm, which is the third principle. But, um, and we're going to get into the meaning of the trident, but I'll just Okay. This one comment, which is that HPB describes the trident as the three in one. Esoterically means the three in one. And it's important to realize that Shiva carries a trident, 
who is mm-hmm. a first ray, the god of destruction. So it's not just an association with water. It's a little more complicated than that. You know, there's uh, stories of gods hurling the fiery trident at each other, you know. Um, so it's not for, it's not for spearing fish, you know. <laughs> okay, thanks. Yeah, sure, Kerr. Anyone else? Okay. Yeah, Samuel is back with us, so let's try. He says he has a comment. Can you unmute yourself now, Samuel? See, I'm trying to find him here. Yeah, hello there. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. Good work. Did you update your Zoom? Oh, yeah, I, I was using different computer. I just went to my laptop. So. Oh, good deal. Yeah, uh, I, I think we are a little bit further, further from what I, what we were talking before, but it was just this point. I, I really found it to be interesting, the Poseidon and uh, the 12 gods. And I I think I was reading something in the Secret Doctrine where it talked about that these uh planets that we see in the sky are just not, they are much more than what we think they are. Those are really the gods that rule this world and that those planets are uh, basically their their dwelling places and they allowed Mm. the initiates to see, uh, only the initiates can see them, but the ordinary person would just see the empty shell or what we do see that we're looking there. Yeah, so that's why I was. I just wanted to say that. Yeah, good. Thank you. Yeah, you're talking about the 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 physical aspect of the planet, yeah. and then the the uh, spirit of that planet, who is yeah. who are personified by the Greeks in these different ways. But exactly. And of course, at that time, Neptune was not discovered, um, so it, the the physical planet was not known. Uh, but the God was. Okay, anyone else? Yes, and Veronica says you should see the picture of Master Hilarion. Oops. Um, the rod is like an electrical rod there. Here for me, it depicts, I guess, the rule over three types of energy. Yeah, and those, and we'll be getting into this, and those energies are uh, the airy. Now, this is, you know, it's not completely translatable into the theosophical understanding, you know, but it's it's close, uh, which is the the air, uh, water and uh, dense earth, which is was the Greek triple understanding. Right. And uh, so that's, you know, that's the three that he's, you could say, ruler over. And it it works, loosely speaking, because, you know, that's the three realms of human endeavor. The except for air is for us, the buddhic plane, and and we associate fire with the mental plane. Uh, But, you know, those two are often interchangeable. Um, So, yes, um, (laughs) I'm not sure what your question was now. Uh, but yeah, it's a three. I think that's the 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 meaning of that. Uh, certainly, one of the meanings of the trident. But the HPB accentuates the idea that it's a three in one, which means the one it, which expresses itself as three. And where have you heard this before? It's every trinity out there, right? As soon as one uh, moves into manifestation, it doesn't become two; it becomes three. Right, um, which is, you know, there is a trinity in every uh, uh, religious or spiritual discipline. So, you know, you're, that's what you're looking at. You know, it's the, he's Shiva, but it's also, um, you know, who originally was Varuna, but where I'm getting, I'm cannibalizing my, my, the future of my webinar here with, uh, but <laughs> which was the original god of moisture or uh, space or sky that uh, then manifest, you know, as Vishnu and Brahma. But we'll get into this. Anyone else? I think we're good right this second.
Okay, so this last little bit, you want to read that BL real quick? Yo, are you there? Oops, sorry, I was reading to myself. The Atlantic <laughs> civilization describes the descent of living souls individualized under the constellation of Pisces from their previous ethereal state into material form at the beginning of human evolution upon the planet. Okay, so you can see what a cosmic um, perspective we're looking at here, right? Um, Atlantis, that's what the Atlantic civilization is, is a description of the descent of living souls, that is, you know, providing a means for souls to incarnate, which individualize under the constellation of Pisces. Now, what this suggests to me is we're looking at a much broader cycle. I mean, you know, we're just at the tail end of the of this 2,500 year period of Pisces right now. And, but this is a cycle even broader than um, the 25,000 plus year cycle that includes within it 12 constellations, right? At least to my mind, that's what it's suggesting. Um, and so they're coming from an ethereal state. And like I said before, this is, of course, the higher ethers, which would include the monadic um, into material form at the beginning of the evolution of the planet. So it's not about this continent, you know, uh, forming and then, you know, part of humanity going there. This is the whole root race of the planet. I think that's the point he's trying to drive home here. Okay. Um, yeah, so H MPH summarizes the link between Neptune and Pisces and their role in humanity's descent into matter. Okay, next up, DK confirm. Uh, Go ahead. Me. We have a couple of comments here. Um, Ann Veronica says it reminds me um, of the word of power on the fourth ray. The two merge into one. Hmm, interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then um, Ephrosini says in Greek mythology, Zeus, Hades, and Poseidon were the original trinity of gods. There it Zeus, is. Zeus, Zeus took the heavens, Hades the subterranean, and Poseidon the water. Yes, and it was even, they even had three names, Zeus Ammon, which is Zeus Jupiter, Zeus Poseidon, which is the ruler of the waters, and Zeus Hades. So the Zeus is the one in, the, in a threefold manifestation. Thanks for that. that. That really helps clear things. I'm seeing Scott's hand. Um, on your previous slide. Huh? On your previous slide. Yeah. Do we have any verification for this? Uh, this is uh, MPH's interpretation, but it's a very high and esoteric point he's making. And I wonder if we can actually lean on that. Do we have any verification uh -huh. of it? Well, you know, read all of MPH, all of DK, and everything MPH has to say, and then compare them and get back to me. Because no, 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 I want to know. Why this not really? No, well, there's no. You mean did did for instance HPP said this book was good or something? No, no. He's saying that they all individualized under the constellation of Pisces into this planet now. Oh, right. Okay. Any, I mean, that's a big statement, considering yeah. when you're talking about previous root races, previous um, uh, planetary incarnations of, of the planet Earth, planetary solar system, or entirely previous solar system. Yeah. It's a, that's a really big statement to be thrown out there, it seems to me. I don't, can't yeah, say it's it could be taken at different levels. For instance, it could have been just initialized, initiated, I should say during the constellation of of Pisces, you know, and that the brew race itself traveled numerous times around, you know, that whatever 
cycle of, of uh, signs we're looking at, you know. Uh, it's, and that could have, you know, and it, it's the difficulty for me is determining at which level this cycle of, of constellations is, is applicable with this, you know. I don't have any problem with the idea that it's, that it, uh, you know, that living souls individualized under that constellation. Um, yeah, I'm not sure I really get your point, Scott. Um, I we, would just like to add as, as an astrologer, you know, there's the, um, the 25,000 uh, year cycle of which we get what we consider to be the ages. Right. Um, of it's, which that's, that's zero, good. of which uh, zero Pisces was the proper alignment, and then there's a, a larger one, a two hundred and fifty um, yeah. thousand uh, uh -huh. cycle, um, and then I imagine there's even a bigger one. But you know, when we're talking rounds and chains and and all of that stuff, and that you know, Anne Veronica says that she says maybe he's talking about the Earth chain. Uh, yeah, I, let me think. No, I think that's going too big because we're looking at a root race here. So it's, it's one of seven on the earth chain, you know, that we're looking at here. Uh, but Scott, make your point again. I, I'm not, are you just saying that, is there verification of this point of view that uh, Atlantis was initiated during a Piscean cycle? Is that, what you're asking? Yeah. Where, yeah. where is this backed up any place that you yeah. found? You know, I, I haven't yet read, and it's going to happen before we get out of this cycle, because this is going to be probably four webinars long, this um, cycle. And, and at this rate, because you guys are so interested, I love it, by the way, you know, maybe even more. Um, and I, I really need to look, read everything HPP said, but she says a lot about she has a whole chapter just on atlantis in the second uh, volume and i've read a lot of quotes from it but and and there's a lot of quotes in this webinar uh but um and maybe that'll shed some light on it but i i really do need to read pretty much everything she has to say about atlantis in order to gain some uh perspective on your question because i think that's what's going to be necessary you know. well, it's in in the, the long run, the big picture. This is uh, a minor point, and not one we need to dwell on. I was just asking. Yeah, um, I don't think. I it's think it's a good. Point. It's a really good point because where, you know, where at the level of cycles are we talking about here? You know, um, you know, we we had a lot of questions between these, but um, you know, there were this the whole uh, the whole quote. You know, should be taken at once right which is that he's talking on this on a real numinal level you know in other words as i understand it oh by the way notice that the the picture that's on the cover of the of the is the same as this one that's what it was taken from us yes um you know he's talking about like after some pralaya right it, but, you know, there's prolias between root races. And I'm thinking that's what we're looking at here. You know, that the prolia between the uh, third and fourth root race, that, um, you know, where the principle of bodybuilding, that's not lifting weights, by the way, of forming and reproducing um, was, you know, being redeveloped. And that Poseidon was a personification of this uh, feminine aspect, basically the humidity and moisture aspect, which is the fecundating principle, right? So we're really talking numinal, but I think numinal between root races, um, they, at least that's that's where it seems to me um, to be placed. And then looking through here. And then he, he, you know, ascribes it to the constellation of, of Pisces here, up here, the empire of the water, your element. Um, 
And he's saying it's not just about the watery parts of the earth, right? Um, because there was no earth and no sea as we know them. That really pitches it out. Um, I don't know what to make of this. There was no earth. Yeah, as we know them, you know. It pitches it really high and it goes back to the... Um, the problem with the word universe at what level are you pitching that you don't yeah. you can go really big or bring it down what universe may mean right it just, the just previous what, life. so who knows yeah at what perlaic level are we emerging from you know and you can you know the as above so below principle is going, going to work which is that at some cosmic level there are poseidon like beings you know which um, preside over the involutional cycle, you know. Um, but when you're talking about Atlantis, you know, it's like a far cry from there is no earth, there is no sea. So at this point, we just have to hold that and see what we come up with okay. later. Okay, let's move on now. Thanks, Scott. Okay, and Joan has her hand up. Uh -huh. Go ahead, Joan. So the comment that you were just making about the uh, development into form uh, from two slides back, I think, mm -hmm. uh, where humans were coming in, into form was what I was thinking and the moisture and humidity linking to our very physical nature where we are a huge percentage of our, our bodies are actually water. You know, that's a really good point. It takes it out of the idea that it has to be, you know, Atlantis and a watery, you know, um, um, uh, uh, cycle that, you know, in fact, uh, all cycles, the physical per, um, incarnation is largely watery. I yeah. can't as it, I think it's the one before, as is the, the world, the earth is so, you know, largely, yeah, the, the reference that you had just made about the physical form. Anyway, just a quick yeah. comment. No, it's, it's a good comment. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, let's go on to DK here. Oh, Brian has his hand up. Okay, go ahead, Brian. Can you unmute yourself, Brian? Yeah, uh, I forgot. What's the name of the book that we're studying from? Okay, it's The Secret Teachings of All Ages by Manly P. Hall. And you can okay. download it online. Okay. And the other question I had um, is the girl who said the original first tr trinity, uh, I just wanted to write that down. I think you said Zeus, Hades, Zeus, who? Zeus, Poseidon, and Hades. Uh, you know, these kinds of questions you can ask BL like in the chat. Oh, okay. So if you don't mind. Um, okay. You know, oh, okay. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. the, last, the last question that I had in regards to all this uh, that I thought was interesting is um, with the mention of Hades and Pluto being the ruler of Poseidon. And what I said earlier about, I thought that uh, Pisces was the beginning of where all this stuff started. But I thought it was interesting because um, the Egyptians talk about basically two Earths, two different Earths, and they talk about, in reality, in Egyptian religion, the way I understand it, is that the, they think that people are basically dead, that all of us are really dead, and it's the, the new Earth, or a form of Atlantis and the astral plane, is where there's a great wedding, and there's a great celebration where the god Anubis, who's associated with the dead, actually is also a god of marriage along with Ceres. And it was my impression that uh, when you are an initiate and you make it to that level, that there's also a wedding that takes place. But I mean, I just thought it was very, just reminding because you were talking about the two Earths and, and that kind mm -hmm. of stuff, whether there are two Earths, but- Well, stick yeah. with us because we, you know, we're gonna be getting into the Egyptian mysteries in uh, future webinars and and all of this will be addressed. And uh, you're right, there's that's this concept of being 
dead to spirit when you're incarnated, you know, that we're born into death and we die into birth is, um, you know, a common aphorism in just about all the religions of the world. But let's move on at this point. I'd like to. Okay. Uh, okay. Can we get a reader, please? Yes. Joan, can you read that for us, please? This is DK talking. Pisces has a fluid, sensitive temperament, which is mediumistic and psychically polarized. Pisces, here the beginning upon the way of life starts with a material receptivity, which will enable him to respond to all contacts in the cycle of manifestation. He is at this stage, negative, fluid, and endowed with an instinctual consciousness, which contains within itself the potentiality of the intuition. But the seed of the intuition is dormant. The mind, which is the instrument of reception from the intuition, is at this stage unawakened. Thank you. So we can see that this there's um, this relates to what we know about. Um, uh, the emotional polarity of the Atlanteans, right? I mean, the, the door into incarnation uh, is ever given as Pisces, I mean, as Cancer. But we can see that this could be a very much ruling and characteristic of a realm such as the emotionally polarized Atlantis. Not to put too fine a point on it, but, you know. Uh, so a couple of part, um, let's see, where are we here? Hang on a second, I've got to, oh yeah, here we go. So HPB, HPB gives us some further insight into the initial apportionment of, um, of the ancient world. Remember um, the idea that it's divided into 12. So could we get a reader for this, please? Carrie, can you read that for us, please? The fact that the Atlantes claimed Uranus for their first king and that Plato com commences his story of Atlantis by the division of the great continent by Neptune, the grandson of Uranus shows that there were continents and kings before Atlantis. For Neptune, to whose lot that continent fell, finds on a small island only one human couple made of clay that is the first physical human man <clears throat> whose origin began with the last sub races of the third root race. It is their daughter Clito that the God marries and it is his eldest son Atlas who receives for his part the mountain and the continent which was called by his name. Thus while Uranus or the host representing the celestial group reigned and ruled over the second race and their then continent. Kronos or Saturn governed the Lemurians and Jupiter, Neptune and others fought in the allegory for Atlantis, which was the whole earth in the days of the fourth race. Poseidon is the last island of Atlantis lasted till about 12,000 years ago. The Atlantes of Diodorus were right in claiming that it was their country the region surrounding Mount Atlas, where the gods were born, that is, incarnated. But it was after their fourth incarnation that they became, for the first time, human kings and rulers. Thank you, Kerry. Uh, so a couple of important points. First, just to clarify, Uranus governed the second root race, while his quote-unquote grandson, Neptune slash Poseidon, two generations later, govern the fourth root race. And secondly, if the statement Atlantis was the whole earth in the days of the fourth root, rate, fourth root race is true, it solves the puzzle of trying to locate Atlantis only uh, within the region of the Atlantic Ocean. This is uh, was the orientation of physical reincarnation at that time. 
Okay, we learned from HPB and Dowson that um, Poseidon's origins, and this helps, I think, with some of the problems we've been grappling with, uh, can be found in the primordial god Varuna. Can we get a couple of ruler, rulers here? <laughs> a couple of rulers. And if you can't rule, you could just read. Okay. Lynn, can you start us off, please? And then Martha. Sure. Uh, it is only much later that Varuna became the Poseidon or Neptune that he is today in the dogmatic pantheon and the symbolic polytheism of the Brahmanas. In the Veda, he is the most ancient of the gods, the same as the Greek Uranos, i.e. the pun, a person, personification of celestial space and the infinite sky, the creator and governor of heaven and earth the king, the father, and the master of the world, of the gods, and of men. Okay, so we get some verification here. Uh, going back to Scott's point, um, if you look at Poseidon as uh, a, a, um, as Varuna, uh, the most ancient of the gods, <laughs> then you have the idea of it being a personification of celestial space, which is very much the point that MPH was making, right? Um, and of the infinite sky, meaning space, right? Um, so this is, you know, again, though, it's a, it's a mix between what level, you know, do you go to cosmic levels here, you know, well, the answer, or systemic, and the answer is yes, it applies in both cases, right? Okay, and then this is from uh, HPB's Collected Works, and this is from the Classical Dictionary of Hindu Mythology, which is also worth a read. Can we get a reader, please? Martha. The universal encompasser, the all-embracer, and Varuna, one of the oldest of the Vedic deities, a personification of the all-investing sky, the maker and upholder of heaven and earth. As such, he is king of the universe, king of gods and men, possessor of a limitable knowledge. The supreme deity to whom special honor is due. He is often associated with Mitra, he being the ruler of the night and Mitra of the day but his name frequently occurs alone, that of Mitra only, seldom. In later times, he was chief among the lower celestial deities called Adichas, and later still, he became a sort of Neptune, the god of the seas and rivers, who rides upon the Makara. This character he still retains, his sign is a fish. Thank you. So all these reasons, are, these all these layers, um, uh, help us understand why Neptune is associated in so many different ways. Indeed, yeah, and and it's also you know a source of the confusion um, because this concept of the waters, um, you know, starts with the literal water, which, you know, the literal Atlantis sunk into, you know, all the way up to uh, cosmic etheric levels, right? Because that's the, you know, what what's called the moist principle, the fecundating um, uh, involutional um, source, right? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting study. And um, you could see, based on these definitions of Varuna, how MPH could arrive at his uh, almost cosmic point of view. Okay. Um, Samuel has his hand up. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Samuel. You should be able to unmute yourself. I don't know why. There you go. Uh-oh. Try again. Try 
Try again, Samuel. You're still muted. There you go. Look, yeah. I don't know why it's happening by itself. I'm sorry. It's OK. okay. Go ahead. Yeah, so there's this little book written by HPB. I think it's one of her books. Uh, it's called The Nightmare Tales. And in there is a story about Varuna. Uh, and this, this story is actually connected to the, uh, the Mahabharata, uh, the section. Yeah. The, the portion of it that is called the Maha, the Ma, Ma, Marahana, something like that. Mahabharata. Uh, yeah, yeah, the Mahabharata and the Maharan, the father Sri Ram, how to go free his uh, wife from uh, this devil king from Sri Lanka. But anyway, uh, in that story, they talk about Varuna, and he's clearly been described as the god of the sky and uh, who was depending on the the divine king uh, of the of Aru, Aruna, which is basically still found in South India today. And so according to this article, it is clearly saying that uh, Varuna is also linked to uh, Neptune in a kind of way. So this kind of confuses me a little bit. Uh, linked so. to what? I didn't hear that word, linked to? Linked to Neptune, uh, Poseidon. Oh, yeah. So it, it kind of, threw me off a little bit because yeah. I know Varuna is supposed to be the god of the air and uh, Neptune, which is Poseidon, is actually uh, connected to the sea. Well, it's god of the sky and the sky yeah. is mm -hmm. space and space are the are often called the waters of space, which is the environment of the fecundating that is the creative agency um, that material and spirit come together and Varuna represents the uh, that aspect right that watery aspect I see thank you yep anyone else uh, yeah Brian's got his hand up but first let me read what Efrosini says she says, I wonder if Uranus is the god of the second root race, Saturn of the third, and Poseidon of the fourth. Well, that's then, what he says. Hold, yeah. hold on, we're not done. Then Jupiter will be the god of the um, Aryan race. And who will be the god of the sixth root race? She says Dionysus. Hmm. Well, that's something to look forward to. Um, can't answer that. Does, are any astrologers slash mytholo mythologers <laughs> uh, aware of 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 uh, that of who might be the sixth root race overlord? You know, well, I'm not sure, but it's it's interesting uh, extension. I like that. It was interesting. Yeah. And, you know, the idea of, of Zeus Amon being Jupiter and the god of air, you know, certainly makes him relevant since we have Atma Bodhi Manas um, as the, you know, the ruling principle of humankind at this point. Anyone else? Brian's got his hand up. Go ahead, Brian. Yeah, I just had a quick uh, question, and that is Osiris' the son... It, I had written down some, some of my writings was also called Oros, uh, O-R-U-S. And I was wondering if, uh, you know, that could also apply to um, Varuna potentially as Horus. Um, no, Horus and Varuna would not be the same idea because Varuna uh, is a primordial fundamental causative principle and Horus is the manifestation of the solar uh, reality, the solar god, the sun. So it's a, it's a little different idea there. Uh, connection yeah. would be more with the, with Isis. Um, but we'll be getting into that when we, when we step into the Egyptian teaching. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, Samuel's got his hand up again. Yeah, um, it's just a question, more like a question um, about the one of the gods that's going to rule us. Uh, I, the question is, I know we are in the uh, Kali Yoga period, and and after this, 
the period that comes, I do not remember the name, but I, I is it is it that period is going to be as I have read somewhere, is it going to be when the sun and Jupiter and I think another planet are going to be in the same house? And, and so would, would, wouldn't that be uh, a combination of gods that would be ruling uh, that period? I don't know what it's going to be, the six root rays, uh, entirely another round. Yeah, I would think we've been coming out of the Kali Yuga since the time that the uh, that we moved into the fifth root race uh, from a theosophical point of view. Now, you know, that may not wash in Hinduism, uh, but in terms of, of those planetary aspects, I can't really answer that that question. Um, I'm going to make a request because um, we're getting a lot of questions today, and I love that. But try to keep your questions relevant to this material specifically, if you can. I would appreciate that. And then as absolutely as wide based as you want. I don't want to discourage questions, but, um, you know, questions about other aspects of mythology and, and you know, et cetera. <clears throat> it's best really to, it, the thing is we'll, we lose the point of tension and the continuity. So let's, let's hold it to Atlantean uh, uh, subject matter, if that's, um, and you know, I say that humbly, really, because, um, you know, I do really invite questions. That's what makes these webinars come to life. But I think it would be, uh, would serve the, the purpose here to um, um, keep your questions relevant to the subject matter. Okay, anyone else? Uh, well, there's a comment from Greg as we close this subject <laughs> that says the next yuga is Duapapara yuga, a major golden age of peace. Right, and that's there's an alignment with the idea of the Dua sixth, Para. seventh. I said rate. that wrong. Okay. okay, and that's it. That's it. Back to Atlantis, please. Yes, okay. So, next we learn, in the midst of the island was a mountain. Here's a 17th century map of Atlantis showing Mount Atlas near its center. Uh, like Meru for the Aryan race, Mount Atlas would have been regarded as the axis mundi of the fourth root race, the center around which the world turned. Again, We'll turn to HPB for further insight on this subject. Can we get a reader, please? Scott, can you read that for us, please? Mountain of the Gods, or Meru, whose, representation, whose representative in the fourth root race was Mount Atlas, was the last form of one of the divine titans. It was so high in those days, the ancients believed that the heavens rested on its top. Did not Atlas assist the giants in their war against the gods, Hygienus? Another version shows the fable as arising from the fondness of Atlas, son of Iapetus and Clymene, for astronomy, and from his dwelling for that reason on the highest mountain peaks. The truth is that Atlas, and also the hero of that name, are the esoteric symbols of the fourth race and his seven daughters, the Atlantes, are the symbols of the seven sub-races. Mount Atlas, according to all the legends, was three times as high as it is now, having sunk at two different times. It is of a, of a volcanic origin, and therefore the voice within Ezekiel says, I will bring forth a fire from the midst of thee, and, in, and it shall devour thee meaning from Mount Atlas, symbolizing the proud race, learned in, mag learned in magic and high in arts and civilization, whose last remnant was destroyed almost at the foot of the range of those once gigantic mountains. Thank you, Scott. And this is a continuation. A reader, please. Okay, Lynn, can you read that for us, please? 
The myth of Atlas is an allegory, easily understood. Atlas is the old continents of Lemuria and Atlantis, combined and personified in one symbol. The poets attribute to Atlas as to Proteus, a superior wisdom and an, and an universal knowledge, and especially a thorough acquaintance with the depths of the ocean, because both continents bore races instructed by divine masters, and because both were transferred to the bottom of the seas, where they now slumber until their next reappearance above the waters. The Odyssey makes of him the guardian and the sustainer of the huge pillars that separate the heavens from the earth. He is therefore supporter and is both Lemuria destroyed by submarine fires and Atlantis submerged by the waves perished in the oceans in the ocean deeps. Atlas is said to have been compelled to leave the surface of the earth and join his brother Hyapatos in the depths of Tartarus. Sir Theodore Martin is right in interpreting this allegory as meaning Atlas standing on the solid floor of the inferior hemisphere of the universe and thus carrying at the same time the disk of the earth and the celestial vault, the solid envelope of the superior hemisphere. For Atlas is Atlantis, which supports the new continents and their horizons on its shoulders. Thank this you. is very interesting in terms of the labors of Hercules. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The idea that, uh, well, you know, Prometheus at one point uh, gave Atlas a, a break and shouldered the earth himself. What does that suggest to anyone? Any thoughts about that? You know, what I think it is, is it's the, you know, it's the, um, that time when the fire of mind was, was given to mankind. So for that time, the, um, the sustaining, continuous sustaining power of Atlas was interrupted by the torchbearers like Prometheus and, and Lucifer, you know, uh, who, briefly uh came into incarnation to uh to um uh give man the fire of mind to communicate that that gift of the gods and then atlas reassumed the burden uh so there's something more primordial in the at, at the atlas um connection uh, with the support at the same time, Francis, that that with that individualization of mind, it, it seems the symbology too is that humanity is now begins to take on the karmic of karma of the planet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true, um, and you know, so what uh, archetype? You know, do we choose for the holding up of the planet? Well, it's going to change with every root race, right? But, you know, she makes a point here, HPB, that um, the third and fourth root race were held by this particular Titanic figure. It's, it's very mysterious. In all the reading I've done about this, there's, you know, it's, he's the personification of Atlas, I mean, of, of Atlantis on many levels. And yet, uh, the the substanding quality suggests that he's that it's a preparing of the ground for that which follows. You know, that's that seems to be the main part of the allegory. Okay, uh, MPH continues. Oh no, we're not going to continue though. That's it, folks. Okay, um, we have one more comment from uh, Ephrosini. Um, did Prometheus or Hercules undertake to relieve Atlas of his weight? Both, actually, at different times. Um, Prometheus, uh, Hercules in the myth of Hercules uh, did do that. Um, he relieved him temporarily. Um, ah, 
I better get back to you. Maybe I maybe I'm mistaken in that. Maybe it was Hercules instead of Prometheus. Um, yeah. Okay. So, and I'd have to think about that a little bit to see the what the meaning of that would be, uh, because you know, in an in a myth, um, you know, the the length of time that that Hercules uh, took on the earth and you say, well, well, let me here, would you hold this again while I get some shoulder pads? You know, you're talking about many astrological cycles there, you know, so there was a, um, I would just offhand say that it had something to do with the, um, uh, the instituting of the, of the path, which was Hercules was uh, known for the fact that he gave the method of release to humankind, one of the earliest avatars in that way. And so there's something of the carrying the earth to that. Um, so anyway, that's that's what I have at this point. Okay, folks, is there anyone else last comments before we, we close today? All right, so um, uh, dates for next time. I think we're back on schedule for, in terms of first and third Sundays. Yes, we are. Um, next uh, Secret Teachings of All Ages is the 4th of July, um, 7 p.m. And before that, on the 20th of June, in two weeks time, we're going to have the next secret doctrine at 7 p.m. Great, great. So what a good way to celebrate the 4th of July, come to a secret doctrine webinar, right? Uh, we'll have our own version of fireworks. Well, thank you all. It's always a pleasure and an honor. And um, I look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Francis. Lots, you. yes, lots of thank yous. Yes, big thank yous. You're welcome. Bye, everybody. Bye, thank you. Bye.